uh, may we request uh, Justice uh, Rohan to please um, pakilapit lang po sa audio. Mahina po yung reception. Thank you, Justice. Hello. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, so, a natural born citizen uh, is one who is born in the Philippines? Yes. No, no. Huh? Ah? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Article 4, Section 2 defines a natural citizen as one uh, who is a citizen of the Republic uh, of the Philippines upon birth without need. Hello. Of, uh, Taking uh, any okay. other action. Uh, so, a natural born citizen uh, is one who is born in the Philippines. Uh, next is uh, the matter of uh, delay. Uh, the Chief Justice is talking about uh, one of fast tracking uh, cases. Uh, first is, of course, we are increasing the uh, monetary uh, jurisdiction of first and second level courts. To, four, to 2 million, from 300,000 to 2 million. Uh, next is uh, findings of facts of uh, the trial court will be final and uh, binding upon the parties. Uh, what can you say about this? Yes, finding of facts from the trial court can be made final considering that they are the ones who heard the evidence presented by both parties. But this is with respect only to cases probably recognizable uh, uh, under the, the claims court, the claim, a small claim court. Uh, with respect to the cases recognizable by the RTC, well, it it, it, it should not be final because the party is entitled to appeal the cases to the appeal. Uh, the case is not final. It's only the findings of facts. By way of parallelism, in the uh, National Labor Relations Commission, the decision of the labor arbiter uh, contains uh, both conclusions, findings, and conclusions of facts and uh, conclusions of law. Now, on the matter of facts, the same is already final and it's not supposed to be reviewed by the uh, uh, NRC. Uh, how, how about regular courts? Remember, the point of the Chief Justice is uh, you can appeal your case, uh, no doubt about that, but on the findings of facts, the same would be binding upon the appellate court. For example, uh, like uh, a labor arbiter or even the NLRC, the decision of the NLRC is now reviewable by uh, by the uh, Court of Appeals uh, under the same party ruling. Uh, but uh, the Court of Appeals will no longer uh, review findings, facts of the uh, of the NLRC. Can that be true in the case of uh, uh, decisions of the second level court, especially if uh, the decision of the second level court involves an uh, appeal from a first level court, find some facts, please. Yes. If, if uh, it can be raised on the appellate court or in the higher court, the, the appreciation of facts, if there is such a thing as misapprehension, and maybe that's where the higher court or the the higher court can take cognizance of the facts presented by the local court. Other than that, I think there is no more need for the higher court to touch on the the uh, ultimate facts uh, presented. So, how how can a green party seek a reversal of a decision based? on uh, unalterable findings of facts. Uh, he goes straight to the Supreme Court? No, or, I'm uh, appellate court. I am referring to the Court of Appeals. So, the only instance wherein the, uh, the Court of Appeals can, or the RTC, based on your facts, can only uh, uh, question 
the appreciation of facts by the lower court is when the uh, RTC or the, uh, the CA found a misappreciation or misapprehension of facts. Other than that, I think they cannot not only facts submitted by or submitted by the other party. Both parties, if both parties already, uh, that's the fact that they have agreed, then the higher court cannot anymore. Uh, last question, uh, uh, please. Uh, on the assumption that you are now with the Supreme Court, and case was raffled off to you, and uh, remember that you are to, the Supreme Court is supposed to dispose of a case within uh, 24 months uh, from submission of uh, the, the case for decision. And it happened uh, that uh, the case was raffled out to you and you only have now 10 days uh, within which to, to act on the case. Uh, how can that decision be uh, be non-violative of uh, the Constitution, the Constitution uh, on the assumption that it now took uh, about uh, two and a half years before it is finally uh, promulgated. If I was not the one who declared that case submitted, then it would not be counted against me. But if it is on me, then I'll have to exert all efforts to finish that case to be able to finish it on the timeline, Your Honor. Uh, okay. Well, uh, by way of uh, clarification, uh, just like the Court of Appeals, uh, we, the deciding uh, the chairman of the division is supposed to come up with a clarification explaining on the delay of uh, the disposition of the case, that is in Article 8, Section 15, Paragraph 3, the Constitution. Such uh, circumstances can be now uh, explained in the certification by the chairman, uh, the, the uh, division at the Supreme Court. That will be all, uh, uh, Your Honor, uh, Chief. Uh, I'm done. Thank you. And good luck, uh, Justice Rogan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. May we ask Attorney Aricheta to unmute his audio, please? Thank you, Attorney Aricheta. Kindly unmute your audio, po. Audio, wala eh. Attorney Aricheta, kindly unmute your audio. Thank you, sir. Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. The next uh, interview... Justice Sorongon will be the Honorable Justice Noel Jimenez. Justice Tiham, sir. Thank you. Uh, Tony Leia, uh, wala yata si Justice Tiham. He's here po, Justice Tiham. Th thank you, uh, Attorney Arichata. Good afternoon, Chief. Good afternoon, Your Honors. It sounds, it sounds like uh, Attorney Arichata is from outer space. Uh, are you well rested, uh, Attorney Edwin? Are you well rested? Sure. <laughs> I've been waiting here since uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. So what preparations did you make uh, to prepare for this uh, public interview? Well, if you ask me my preparation, I've been reading several uh, times or writing several uh, articles, but Today, I just realized that what I have read are not really all important. <laughs> because that okay. never so, so I will uh, ask you questions on matters which you did not read. Yes. Okay. Yes. 
So, Attorney Edwin, uh, this very prominent case of ABS-CBN before the Supreme Court, uh, by way of academic discussion, don't you think that the case involves not only questions of law, but also questions of facts? Well, I, 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 think, I think so, because the issues, for me, uh, this is my take, there are, I think, uh, three issues to be tackled in that case. One... No, is, just, just, just answer my question. Yes. So, you agree that there are questions of facts. Yes. Well, what is your understanding of the hierarchy of courts? Well, the hierarchy of courts, you have, you have the Supreme Court, then we go down to the Court of Appeals, then the RTC, and the Municipal Court. Considering that it's a fact that the Supreme Court does not tackle questions of facts, and considering that it is an admitted fact that justices in the Court of Appeals have lower, have less work than the justices in the Supreme Court, do you think it's proper that the Supreme Court remand the case, the Court of Appeals instead, to hear that petition? Um, that was the ruling of the Supreme Court in Gio uh, Samar. If there are um, fact uh, factual issues to be resolved in determining the legal issues, then it should be the Court of Appeals or the Trial Court to sue. All right. let, let me ask you a question that has been asked this morning. The principle of stare decisis. Can you refresh my memory again? What is your understanding of the principle of stare decisis? Case which have already been heard inside it. It's can no longer be, uh, but it's, it's, it's considered settled and can no longer be litigated again. When I was a member of the court, one of my colleagues on the court said in jest that after I retire, they can go ahead and reverse my decision. Do you think that's a, that's a practical reason for reversing decisions of the court when the ponente is no longer an incumbent of the court? No, Your Honor. All right. But you agree with me that there are instances wherein the court has to reevaluate, to review a prior decision, and that there might be a need to set aside the principle of stare decisis and overturn that decision. Do you agree with that observation? I agree, Your Honor. So, what do you think would be valid reasons to overturn or to reverse? A decision of the Supreme Court. When uh, <clears throat> so, if you are fortunate to join the Supreme Court, and you feel passionate about the fact that a particular decision rendered by the court several years ago needs to be reviewed or reconsidered, what would be a valid reason? The reason would be uh, time and circumstances change. When the decision, the first decision, when that original decision was made, maybe uh, the circumstances surrounding the surrounding the facts of the case, as well as the circumstances, would have been different as compared now. So when this present case is brought before the Supreme Court, the the the, the, the court may reevaluate their position and say if there is a need. To, to, re, to, to, to review the precedents and have a new decision. Justice Kavanaugh of the U.S. Supreme Court wrote in the case of Roe versus Wade that prior decisions can be overturned if they are grievously wrong. Can you think of a, an example where a prior decision is grievously or blatantly wrong? Here in our Philippine setting, well, 
any, well, a decision where maybe um, laws, applicable laws was not properly applied or rights of individuals were transgressed, uh, were not, were not, uh, were violated and yet they were ignored by the court. So maybe, maybe a review of that decision is just uh, sufficient. Supposing the decision is overwhelmingly unpopular with the public, overwhelmingly unpopular, would that be a valid reason to review and reevaluate or reverse or overturn the prior decision? No, Your, no, your Honor. The court should not be influenced by popular, uh, by, uh, by uh, outside forces like uh, popular opinions. We should be guided by the, by the facts and the law applicable to a particular case. But I'm talking about public, yes. not public acceptance, but public rejection. I'm not talking of opinions. When I say overwhelmingly, talagang ayaw ng mga tao yung decision, maling mali. Understanding, Your Honor. Now, in the U.S. Supreme Court, they have this policy that so long as the justices who participated in the decision are still incumbents, Major if majority of those who participate, because there are nine justices in the U.S. Supreme Court, so long as majority of those who participated in the decision are still incumbents, they have this policy that they will not change, they will not review, they will not reverse the decision, even if it is wrong, if it is a clear mistake because of that policy, because the those who participated as, are still incumbent. Do you think that policy is a good policy that can be adapted by the Philippine Supreme Court? Well, I, I, I think that's a good policy so that uh, at least we know all the time we know the position of each justices in a particular case. So when it is uh, brought for review, you know already who will be voting for or against a particular issue of the case. Under the revised corporation code, what is now the corporate life of corporations? It's now perpetual. Uh, perpetual. Unless? Unless there is a, a provision in the articles of corporation to have a limited period. So that's the that's a new new provisions. All right. Uh, if there are aliens who are permanently residing in the Philippines, can they be required by the government to render military service? No, Your Honor. Why not? Well, they are, are they are they beyond the sovereignty of the Philippines? No, Your Honor. If they are permanently residing in the Philippines? Uh, the Constitution says that uh, um, it's only for the Filipinos and then their military service. To the country. Are, are aliens or permanent residents not entitled to protection from the Philippine government? They are, Your Honor. Do they owe temporary allegiance to the government who provide protection for them. Yes, they have temporary allegiance. When they so they cannot be compelled to render military service. Yes, Can you visualize to us more or less, because of this pandemic, are there certain constitutional rights of the citizens which may have been affected? The right to travel, but the uh, right to travel, because of this pandemic, there was uh, uh, restrictions or limitations to our right to travel. Can I ask you a question? Can I, if the government 
through the Department of Health confirms that a person, a person is afflicted with COVID-19, can the government go inside the residence of that person and bring that person to the hospital for confirmatory testing? Yes, can, yes. Can, can that person be compelled to go with the personnel of the Department of Health? Yes, Your Honor. Is that not a violation of certain rights? No, Your Honor, because under, we are now under abnormal circumstances and uh, the state is... You mean, you mean abnormal circumstances? Abnormal circumstances, Your Honor. We are very on uncertain times. And uh, the priority of the government is to take care of the health and welfare of its inhabitants. So one of these, uh, one of these, uh, the one of the purposes of this government in taking this patient to the hospital is to address the spread of the virus. So I think it's within the power of the state to do it. Are you in favor of? compulsory, mandatory COVID-19 testing? Yes, Your Honor. At whose expense? At the expense of government or to be shouldered by the citizen himself? Well, uh, for those in, for those working in the private and government sector, it should be shouldered by the employer. But for those who are not, especially in the barangays, then it should be the barangay or the government who should shoulder the expenses. In the private sector, Justice Edwin, if the employee is tested and found to be afflicted by COVID-19, and for a long period of time is unable to report for work, is there a valid cause for the employer to discharge or to dismiss that employee? I think that's not, that, that is not a valid ground to dismiss the employee. Are you in favor of contact Tracing. Yes, Your Honor. Is it proper? Is it valid for your neighbor to call the police and the authorities that one of your, one of the residents, one of the occupants in your house is afflicted with COVID-19? Is that allowed? In other words, to allow people to spy on their neighbors and uh, report to the authorities people who are afflicted with COVID-19? Uh, the, the contact tracing should be done discreetly and uh, uh, it should guarantee the privacy of every individual. So what you're saying, Your Honor, that they can just go into one's house and uh, spy into the, 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 the person's inside is not... It's not uh, uh, right. There's no violation of privacy rights. There is if they will encroach into the... But if the, the contact tracing is done discreetly, it guarantees privacy then and secrecy, then it's allowed. What about prohibiting public worship, religious worship in churches? Is there no encroachment on certain freedom of worship on the part of the citizens? At this time, uh, Your Honor uh, writes uh, this kind of constitutional rights, right to, to gather and to assembly, uh, should take a back seat because we are now in a situation where we have also to address the problem of health in our country. Are you suggesting that certain constitutional rights are suspended 
during the period of pandemic under the uh, Bayanihan Heal as One law? Not really suspended, but have to be limited for the time being or restricted for the time being. If schools and universities open classes and one of their students die because of COVID-19, is the school liable under the law? I, I think so, Your Honor. I think so, Your Honor. All right, my last two questions. In court proceedings, when do you move for the exclusion of evidence which is improper? At the time when it is being offered. You mean to say during the trial itself? Can it be done? Can it be done during the pre-trial conference? Yes, I know. Because during the pre-trial conference, there are still on. We are uh, the, the the parties are still on the marking stage, so I think it will be. Uh, Isn't it that during the pre-trial, the purpose is to lay your cards on the table? and to disclose all of your evidence? Sorry. Yeah, that's in the arm. Um, oh, yes. Yes. What is a motion? What is a, this is a giveaway question. What is a motion in limine? L-I-M-I-N-E. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I have this the first you, you, you just explained it earlier. It is a motion to eliminate improper matters mentioned or introduced before the trial. That is a motion in limine, which can be done during the pre-trial conference. How do you do, differentiate it from a motion to evidence? Sorry, Your Honor, I wasn't able to get. Uh, how, how do you, how do you differentiate it from a motion to suppress evidence? The motion in limine, as distinguished from motion to suppress evidence. You are not allowed to to present that kind, that piece of evidence. Well, in limine. Yeah, yeah, the same objective, but there's a difference aside from the spelling. What's the difference? <laughs> when you say to suppress, you exclude illegally obtained evidence, all right? While in limine is improper, improper evidence. Why do you want to be in the Supreme Court, Justice Edwin? Was it also your dream? No, it's not my dream, but it's my aspiration. It's not your dream, aspiration. Because I said, if it is your dream, and many applicants have stated it is their dream. And then if they don't get it, they have to go back to sleep and dream further. All right, that's all. Thank you, Justice Edwin, and good luck. Thank you, Justice Tiham. The next to interview, Justice Roman will be the Honorable Judge Tulibio Ilaw, Jr. Judge Ilaw, sir. Yes, thank you, uh, Attorney Aricetta. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon again. Good afternoon, members of the JVC. Uh, uh, good afternoon, Justice Solomon. Your Honor. <laughs> How are you today? Hey, you look good, huh? I'm fine. Did you get <laughs> Were you able to sleep? Well, How uh, early last night? I woke up very early today. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we'll just have a few questions. And uh, how many times uh, had you applied as an associate justice of the Supreme Court? This is my uh, second time, Your Honor. Second time. The first time was uh, in 2019. Yes, Your Honor. All right. Uh, so 
there are 13 applicants vying for the position of the state justice of the Supreme Court. The competition uh, seems to be fierce. Why should you be chosen but to be included over other applicants who have similar qualifications? Well, I, I, my experience uh, uh, can speak for itself. I have been in the in uh, government service since 1986. I started my career as a fiscal in my province. Then for, for several years, I transferred to Manila and became also a fiscal in Mandaluyong. I have a 12 year stint, 11 year stint in the prosecution service and uh, 12 years stint as an RTC judge also in Mandaluyong and 10 years as a court of appeals justice. Uh, I started applying for the Supreme Court only last year when I became a senior member on the uh, Court of Appeals. Presently, I'm the uh, chairman already uh, of the uh, uh, 17 division. And uh, those long years of, uh, of uh, experience have honed my, my uh, myself of, uh, of uh, working towards uh, my career advancement. I also have uh, realized that in this uh, stage of my life, I also have to think of something that I can be, live a legacy of a meaningful life to our people and country. So that's the reason why I should aspire for the position of a magistrate. I can that's only tell my experience in my qualification in the government and the judiciary. Uh, Justice, uh, could you tell us about the business of your wife? That he, you indicated in a PDS, she's a, has a housewife and at the same time a businesswoman. Yes, she, she has now retired, but uh, uh, prior to her retirement, she was with uh, Sunlight of Canada. And after she retired, she now works as on commission basis. From time to time, she just submit her sales. And she, is, she also have uh, business in uh, what you call this, um, the build and sell. They have uh, with together with uh, with her with our children, so that's her business. Uh, and we also have a small business in the province. How about your son? My son is uh, a former PBA player, and she has and he has also his own business. He has. Is on gasoline station. Uh, ah, I see. Uh, you indicated in your PDS that uh, he is a head coach of a team. Uh, coaches, uh, assistant coaches in the PBA up to now. Up to now. What's the team? Uh, Pure Foods, Your Honor. Sun Wing Pure Foods. All right, uh, going over. Uh, the records in your PDS. How come there were certain cases in the JVC's record that you did not disclose in your latest PDS? What is your honor? Uh, I have disclosed all these cases. You mean the administrative cases, your honor? Yes, please. Because, uh, for example, the letter complained by a certain Gray Oliver Pies. That was when I was still an RTC judge, Your Honor. But you did not uh, disclose this uh, yes. in your PDS. I already explained that uh, last time, Your Honor, when I was also asked by Your Honor, that I said uh, I made a report, a letter, asking the 
the Supreme Court of uh, the resolution so that I can touch it. And they said there is no more case about it. So I just ignore it and I don't have to place it. I decide not to place it anymore in my PDS. Because that happened when I was still in the early part of my RTC uh, stint. And so when I applied for the CA, I asked for a resolution. They said they don't have that it anymore. And in fact, there is, uh, that's the reason why I did not include that in my PDS, you know. About this IPI number 13-11, CA-J, filed by attorney Elihio P. Maliari. Is that also disclosed in your PDS? I, I, I have, we, I, I place it, Your Honor. I'm sorry if I, it was inadvertently omitted, but I have been uh, uh, writing because several times that guy, that attorney Maliari had been charging us, in fact, some of the personalities who he had also included in, are now retired and some are now in the uh, high courts, Your Honor. I, I included that. Uh, maybe inadvertently it was omitted, but surely I, I will always include that, that case of Mariana. And the last one is also the falsification of public document for antedating a resolution filed by, again, Attorney Elio P. Maliari. That's the same thing. Yes, Your Honor. I, 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 I'll have to double check it, but I have, I, I'm very certain that I have included that, Your, Your Honor, because that's the cases that had been, uh, several cases that had been filing against us. You know. But what does the PDS ask? or require you, every applicant, to disclose any case or cases, administrative cases, criminal cases, or civil cases. Yes, I know, Your Honor. But I'm pretty sure, Your Honor, that I have, maybe, I don't know, uh, something is wrong with the submission of my EDS. No, no. I'm very sorry. But, by the way, who prepared your last PDS? I, 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 it was... Uh, I, uh, it was prepared by my staff, but I have to review everything, Your Honor. But if, if, you, if you will notice, Your Honor, I submitted that, I think, on the last day uh, of the, uh, the, the last day of my supposed submission. But I was very sure, Your Honor, that I, I, cannot, uh, I cannot have to, to I should not uh, forget the case. Because the file of that case is so voluminous already in my, and I'm very aware of that case, Your Honor. And in fact, all those cases have already been dismissed against us, and he's now the one facing charges, Your Honor, not us. All right. Uh, do you recall the case of uh, Strada versus Escritor? What is the benevolent neutrality approach on the Constitution's religious closet? Uh, benevolent neutrality is that uh, the, the government should accommodate uh, the religious practice of persons or groups uh, without any hindrance. Um, the purpose of which they are able to practice their, their belief. You know, Really, without any restrictions from government or from uh, any others. That's the uh, so many things, excuse me. Uh, so many things have been said about the subjudicial rule. We have this uh, petition for co warranto involving ABS. We have this uh, case filed. Very ABS uh, questioning the propriety of the cease and desist order of the NTC. We have these uh, hearings in the House of Representatives. That, that's one benefit of the private sector, of which I represent, and the layman. 
what is this subjudicial rule and how is it applied? Yes. Uh, the subjudicial rule, for me, only applies to the parties, to the case. But for those individuals who are not a party to the case, especially those in the media, as long as their reporting is objective and factual, then I, I believe that they should, as long as it is factual and that it will not affect the or influence the decision of the court, then I think they should be allowed to speak about the case. We have also to balance the right of uh, the citizen to information and uh, the freedom of expression as well, and the authority of the court that its uh, authority should not be trampled upon by anyone else. So there should, there should be a balance between the two. So I, I think the subjudice rule applies only to the parties and to the, to the lawyers and to those who are in a way connected with the case. And those in the media or other persons, as long as the reporting is factual and objective, I think they are allowed to do so. That's my take on the subjudice rule. The subjudice rule restricts comments and disclosures pertaining to judicial proceedings to avoid prejudging the issue, influencing the court or obstructing the administration of justice. And any violation of the subjudice rule may render one liable for indirect contempt. Yes, sir. Uh, what are the exceptions? There too. The judicial rule. Well, yes, are, sir. Are there exceptions? Well, but that's, as I said earlier, one of the exception, exception is uh, the right to of the of the public to information. I think that's the only one I can remember. And the right of free speech. Uh, what is the latest case uh, you read when uh, decided with the Supreme Court? Well, uh, I have browsed the case of the one penned by before he died Justice uh, Hadelesa, the Gio Sama. The Gio Sama case wherein uh, it is stated there in the hierarchy of courts and that uh, Transcendental importance or compelling reasons are no longer grounds for the Supreme Court to take cognizance of any case. If there are factual issues to be to be resolved in determining the legal issue, then it will have to be the Court of Appeals or the Trial Court to take cognizance of the case. That's the last case I the latest I have. And of course, the one penned by Chief Justice uh, about the uh, Section Twenty One uh, that uh, were include the separate. Uh, the, there was uh, um, what you call this um, violation of the separation of powers between Congress and uh, the Supreme Court since uh, plea bargaining uh, as as. Uh, mandated by the Congress in its uh, uh, regulation. Um, drug offenders are not included, drug lords are not included in pre bargaining. And Chief Justice uh, in his uh, decision said that it cannot be. And uh, in fact, uh, struck down and declared it unconstitutional. You are. That's the case. Okay. All right. uh, what is the pronouncement of the court regarding disability benefits by seafarers or seamen taking into 
consideration the labor code and the POA Security Exchange Commission. What? It's that the seamen nowadays are uh, there seamen seafarers. Uh, they, they are entitled to their uh, just in case of disability. Yes, uh, disability entitled to 120,000 uh, award and uh, it will be paid by their employer or by the agent who. Who hide them? All right. Uh, another case is presidential immunity from suit absolute or limited to official acts? Uh, what the, was the pronouncement of the court in the Lima versus Duterte? Uh, this is the, a given question. Uh, it's, if it's the uh, official act of the president, then he cannot be sued uh, even after his term. He cannot be sued. But with respect to the acts which is not the official act of the president, then he can be sued after his term of office president. I think that's my... All right, my last question, Justice uh, Solomon. What is the most innovative idea you have implemented in the judiciary? Well, honestly, none. Your Honor, I, I cannot think of one. Yes, yes that's very <laughs> except Except the disposal of cases, that's the only one I can think of, Your Honor. Yeah, I can. Uh, Thank you for such humility and honesty. And uh, thank you, Justice, and good luck again. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Ilo. The next to interview the candidate will be the Honorable Justice Jose Catral Mendoza. Justice Mendoza, sir. Good afternoon, uh, because I've already extensively interviewed uh, Justice Soromon. Uh, I have no more questions. Ah, wait a minute. I'll ask him about this. You mentioned earlier that uh, the Supreme Court struck down uh, the, the provision in that law wherein uh, an accused cannot plead guilty to a lesser offense in that a drug law. No. Do, you, do you know the reason given by the court? The, the plea bargaining, Your Honor. Plea yes, bargaining. yes. What is the reason of the court? When it, it, when it said that it was unconstitutional. It says, first, um, procedural, that refers to procedural matters. And therefore, it's the court, uh, when it comes to procedure, pleadings, and practices, it's the, within the ambit of the Supreme Court to formulate such uh, a regulation. And another one, there are a lot of uh, uh, accused who are sentenced to a more serious offense than drugs, and yet they can enter into key bargaining. These are the only things you can remember, Your Honor. You can remember. Okay. And uh, uh, the Supreme Court said that they cannot intrude into the rulemaking power of the Supreme Court. Yes. What is your view on penalty? What is your understanding of penalty? Is it law? 
or procedural law? It's a procedural law, Your Honor. Procedural law? You mean to say if Congress uh, no. imposes a penalty, it is procedural? No, it's, no, it's, it's not procedural. Sorry, Your Honor. Sorry. Substantive, substantive law. And, but they can prescribe a penalty. That becomes the, uh, the And they can prescribe a pe penalty. Uh, and can they say that a court cannot sentence as an accused to a penalty lower than that? Is that not substantive law? Does that refer to the rulemaking of the court? That belongs to the court, Your Honor. So the penalty? Penalty no, belongs no. to the court? No. The penalty is with uh, with Congress, but when you say the uh, whether what penalty to be imposed in a particular offense, yes, yeah, so it's the court. Who it's will, the court who will determine what penalty for a particular accused. Can you change the penalty provisions in the uh, uh, prescribed by Congress? Uh, I'm sorry, Can I you change in the study channel. I, I, uh, I, I'm saying that. Uh, I can understand you. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> It's the court who imposes the penalty. Imposes the penalty. Which is... He cannot change the penalty. Expect by uh, the lawmaking body. Oh, yeah. The court cannot change the penalty. And imposes the penalty. Oh. What is the effect of allowing the accused to uh, plead guilty to a lower offense? Is that not lowering the penalty? No, I don't, I don't think it's part of uh, lowering the penalty. It, it, the title is plea bargaining. So it's lowering the penalty? No, no it's, it uh, it's the effect. The effect is lowering the penalty, Your Honor. Yes, yes. Uh, it's no, not, so it's not circumvention of the law. Uh, how do you reconcile that? Well, that's, that's it, Your Honor. That... Uh, the bargaining, the 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 it's not an it's not the application of penalty because of the bargaining, but it's just how uh, the, the accused. Yeah, the court allows you to plead guilty to an, a lower offense. That will be another offense. Yes, downgrading. So you. another, another it's another offense, not per, a penalty imposed by Congress. It's the offense which is being lowered, not the penalty. It's the offense which is being lowered. Because of the plea bargaining. So the, the penalty, penalty. Uh, yeah, the, the court sent, sent, sentences the accused to a penalty appropriate to the lower offense. Okay. You mentioned earlier the case of Gio Samar and you said transcendental importance is no longer allowed. So the ABS-CBN case is, will, no, will no longer be allowed in the Supreme Court? Yes, as, as long as the, uh, the, the issue there in the case, uh, determining of the legal issue is the evaluation of the factual issues, then even if it's of transcendental importance, then it will not be settled by, it will be resolved by the Supreme Court. So. Your opinion is that it should be dismissed. Yes, if there are factual issues, it should not be. It should be dismissed. Yes. How about remanding it to the Court of Appeals on Rule 43, considering that NTC is a quasi, uh, yes. uh, body. quasi judicial body? That, that, in fact, that was when when I have read that when I read that in the internet. I, I was of the thinking that maybe they will bring the case to the uh, Court of Appeals because they are assailing the, or the, the order issued by the NTC. So that's the report. But they went straight to this. I don't know. There is some for that. You don't know. Suppose you're appointed to the Supreme Court. Well, I, I, I've already given you a They should not. It should be, unless there are other issues which I, I'm not, uh, I'm not aware of it. 
that they have to tackle it. But uh, if that's the only issue, then it should be Rule 43. I am not aware of other issues they have they have uh, incorporated in their petition. Thank you very much, Justice. That Thank you. Those should be all. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, uh, Thank you Justice Mendoza. Yes. The next to interview the candidate will be the Honorable Chief Justice Yusdado Peralta. Chief Justice, okay. sir, it's your turn. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chief Justice. This is uh, Ron, no? You mentioned one of the cases that I penned on yes. the free bargaining, Section 23 of 9165. Yes, Your Honor. Now, I will ask you, I will, I will ask you this. Did you read the, the case of... Uh, Inmates versus Honorable uh, Justice Secretary de Lima and Secretary of Local Government, uh, Manuel Rojas. I mean, uh, yeah. Did you read that case? I, I about, think... about about the uh, uh, allowance of uh, good uh, good allowance. PCTA, your honor. Conduct allowance. Uh, not, did you read? not the full text, your honor. Because you were talking about penalty a while ago, you were asked by Justice uh, Mendoza. Hmm. The uh, issue there is uh, whether or not the IRRI of the Department of Local Government and the Department of Justice is unconstitutional, specifically Section 4 of that IRR, because it provides that this law, this IRR, will not have a retroactive effect. It is prospective in nature. So the issue then is, will you give a, a prospective effect or retroactive effect to implementing rules and regulation when the law itself is not a penal law? Because allowance or allow, good conduct allowance is not a penal law. Because under the provisions of the allowance, of good, good conduct allowance that when you have served the minimum no, of the sentence, or even uh, you have served uh, the, uh, less than the minimum sentence, applying the uh, computation of good conduct allowance, then you will be released. Okay. Now, that IRR provides that this law will not be given retroactive effect because they amended the provisions of the revised penal code to include now preventive imprisonment as one preventive reason to be included in the in the good conduct allowance and before it was not included. Okay. Do you, do you understand? Yes, 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 the, sir. Fact? Yes, sir. the IR says that preventive although preventive imprisonment is not provided under the law, it will not be given retroactive effect. It should be prospective because according to the respondents, that is not a penal law. The uh, code conduct allowance is not a penal law. It is merely a reduction of the penalty because of the good conduct. So what, 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 how would how uh, you agree? Yes. Question, is it a retroactive effect or prospective effect? Well, the, the law, if applied, will be beneficial to those who are affected by that uh, uh, IRR. So I think it should be given retroactive effect. But the law, but the law of, retro, of retroactivity says that penal law shall be given retroactive effect if favorable to the accused. The IRRI is not a penal law. It is merely commutation of sentence because of, I mean, it is a reduction of the sentence because of good conduct allowance. It's not a penalty. They yeah. say it is penalty. penalty. But, then, but again, it would be favorable to the to the, to the to the image you are. Even if it's not a penalty. Yes. That, that, or I mean, even, even if it's not a penal law. Yes, Your Honor. Well, even if it is not a penal law, if it will in effect affect the penalty to be imposed, then it should be given retroactive effect. Okay. Now, you were, you were a former uh, fiscal and RTC judge. I asked this question many times. I hope that uh, you are not familiar with this question. Under the Constitution, bail is a matter of right. 
except except those crimes where the, where the penalty is life imprisonment, reclusion for peta, or death. Yes, sir. Where, the, where the prosecutor must establish, must establish if the evidence of guilt is strong to deny bail. Yes, so it's not a matter. Now, there is a proposal that instead of holding trial to determine if the evidence of guilt is strong, it will just be merely a hearing, some sort of emotion, and then the hearing will be conducted where the prosecution will just present the affidavits of arrest or even the affidavits of the complainants, and then the counsel of the accused will be given the time to object to the admissibility of the affidavits and so on without necessarily presenting a witness to testify on the contents of the affidavits. So what, what, is, your, what is your opinion on that? Because well, if we will set that as valid, then you can just imagine the resolution of petition for bail will not be by, will not be very fast because you will no longer conduct trial and hear the, the testimonies to the witnesses. Would that be proper? That, that will be that will be a uh, um, good practice if implemented because even if you will allow the prosecution to present the evidence, the same thing will happen because they, all the evidence that they will be presenting is already in the affidavit form, and it's or there the defense can just make an oral argument in defense of his client. So. There is, there is no I mean. so, But in that situation, justice, but in that situation, there is no cross examination of the witness. There is none. But you are not, not the te test the credibility of the witness because there is no cross examination. Yes, but uh, in, in, in that case, the art of uh, argumentation will be on the part of the defense counsel again. So there is no cross examination. But the defense counsel will be given the opportunity to argue the case of his uh, client. And the prosecution will just present all the affidavits and the defense counsel will have more time to study the, 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 the affidavits of the witnesses for the prosecution. Same thing, with your honor. Same thing will happen, Your Honor, if they are allowed to testify. Because what will be examined, what will be cross-examined by the defense counsel will be the subject of his argumentation also. But under our jurisprudence, whatever evidence adduced in the hearing of petition to bail shall be automatically reproduced as yes. part of the evidence in chief. So if it is merely presentation of the happy dabbies, how can they be considered as part of the evidence in chief or, or reproduced when there is no cross-examination? Reproduce, but during the presentation, Your Honor, uh, of the uh, evidence in chief. Maybe that's the time when you will, if the case will uh, uh, prosper, then that's the time when the witness will have to make an oath. Okay, let's go to another party. There, there has been a lot of uh, questions or queries about the issuance of uh, temporary restraining orders uh, from parties, litigants, and even lawyers, because they say that uh, there has been indiscriminate issuance of TROs without following the doctrines laid down by the court. Now, as a justice of the court of appeals, how many times have you issued the temporary restraining order, justice? Yeah, in my entire sleep, I won't be mistaken. The last 10 years, I issued five. 10 years, the last 10 five? years. Yes, you are. Five right. years. Ah, about 10 years. But what about as a judge? As a judge, uh, I cannot recall, but... Uh, but you, you, can, you recall a PTRO that issued involving uh, two big businesses where you were reversed by the Supreme Court <laughs> because of the issuance of a PTRO. You remember that? When I was still an RTC, Your Honor. Yeah, that, yeah you were an RTC. It's about infringement. Uh, yes, uh, uh, the, uh, the SMC case, Your Honor. Uh, yeah. No, I do not want to mention the parties, you're the one mentioning it. I will just, I will just, you just wait for my question. Yes, uh, I, I was by the Court of Appeals, Your Honor, but I think in the Supreme Court I was reversed. No, 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 you, you, you just you maintain. No. It's, it's like this. I ask you this question because I do not know if you agree with me that the issuance of a PRO is the exception rather than 
the general rule. This is the exception rather than the general rule. Did you get what I mean? Yeah, it is the exception because you disturb the uh, exercise of a right that belongs to the other party. Is it not? That's correct. And, and the decisions of the Supreme Court have been very clear on that. Is it not? Yes, sir. Yes. So I ask you that question because sometimes some judges are not are not so familiar with the doctrines laid down in the TRO, and there have been uh, and there have been indiscriminates of the issuance of the TRO. And as I said, the issuance of the TRO the exception rather than the general rule. Now, just our uh, congressman uh, Belos is still here. No, this has been the problem of businessmen involved in shipbuilding. The role, the role on claims for uh, disability, partial or total disability is that the decision of the NLRC in so far as liability of, of shipbuildings immediately executory. In other words, once a decision, once a decision is rendered by the NLRC, even if you go to the, to the court of appeals, the seafarer can move for the execution of the liability. I think that's the rule. Yes. Is, that, is that not the rule? Yes, yes immediately executory, right? Yes, Your Honor. And in most cases, the Coro appeals uh, uh, sustain the decisions of the NLRC. Okay. Okay, do, do, do you follow? Do you follow? Yeah, okay. Well, then, when these cases are uh, brought to the Supreme Court, there are cases that are reversed. And then now we now require the seafarer to reimburse or to return the amount previously executed. Now you remember that? Okay, you do that now. What suggestion are you going to? Because it is a pity for seat buildings to have paid the amounts only to find out that they once should not have paid because the seafarer or the heirs are not entitled to liability. So, yeah. what is your suggestion? Personally, in cases like that, you have to, 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 to study carefully the facts. If it involves big sums of money, then you, you, there, is, there is a need for the court to issue a TRO on the matter. To preserve the, uh, the, the 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 status quo. How can because you how can you issue how can you issue a restraining order? The resolution of the NRS is immediate executory. It yes, is already executed. Eh? And uh, and uh, the appeal filed before the before the court appeal does not stop the execution of the you know the monetary award. But they have and to. It's uh, been define as a procedure. Uh, a bond. Do you think it can be cured by a rule to be promulgated by the Supreme Court on that? Or it should be through judicial uh, ju uh, through judicial act? Well, with, with, the, uh, with the Supreme Court power to promulgate rules, I think we, the Supreme Court can have huh? uh, that, Your Honor. The, the, uh, the, the, the making power of the Supreme Court, they can do that, Your Honor. You can do that. Can you raise an issue of unconstitutionality of that provision on the ground that the appellate court or the Supreme Court is deprived of its discretion in resolving that an issue that is still to be brought to the higher court? In okay. other words, the Supreme Court is deprived of reviewing the decision of the NRC on that. Oh, you better, uh, what's your opinion on that? Well, so I, my my, my uh, opinion is that if we can have in the level of the Supreme Court being the the highest uh, law of the land, you can promulgate rules. You can, instead of bringing it up to the to Congress. So it's a Supreme Court to can act right now. Uh, last, last, last point. You're talking about hierarchy of courts. 
Now, there are cases that are brought to the court on Rule, on rule 65, Petition for Certiorari. Yes. And according to Congressman Veloso, under Section 1, the respondents are judicial or quasi-judicial bodies or tribunal. You are correct? Yes. But the, but uh, can you file uh, Rule 65 if what you are questioning is the rulemaking? Act or the quasi legislative act of a quasi judicial body, can you bring it to the Supreme Court under Rule 65? <laughs> Supposing some, some, somebody says this, uh, le this legislation or this, this, this the role, uh, for example, the, the, the joy, the DOJ, like in the case of the inmates. It was the IRRI that was questioned, a provision of Section 4. And the case was brought to the Supreme Court under Rule 65. But the issue there is the constitutionality of Section 4, which is a rulemaking act of a quasi-legislative body. So okay, can that be done? Well, if it was done, if we can, on, that we can, done, we can do that... Uh can be accepted by the Supreme Court, Your Honor. Yes. Well, what happens to a hierarchy of courts? According to you, in the case of Samar, if it is a hierarchy of court, then it should not, but, should not be acted upon. But uh, since the issue there is the constitutionality, so this can go straight to the Supreme Court, not to the lower courts. But it, it, do you think that it would have been a case of declaratory relief where the Supreme Court has no jurisdiction? and file it with the RTC so that we can apply the doctrine laid down in the case of Samar? Because declaratory relief, the Supreme Court has no jurisdiction. So what they use, what I think, what they do is that they file petition for certiorari and the Rule 65. Even if what is being questioned is a rulemaking act of a quasi-legislative body. But what do you say? So if it's, if it's not the constitutionality, then it can be filed in the lower court, but if there is an issue on constitutionality, then it should be goes straight to the Supreme Court, Your Honor. Why? Because the RTC has jurisdiction also. But again, it's, it's the constitutionality of the law may be brought before the RTC is concurrent. That's yes. why we, we are always saying hierarchy of courts. But they bring the case to us under Rule 65 when in fact the issue raised is a quasi-legislative act. It pertains to a quasi-legislative act or a rulemaking act of a, uh, a quasi-judicial body. Well, well, of course, in some cases, we, uh, we you know, we uh, consider them as a petition for prohibition, like in the cases of the inmates. In so many cases, the Arroyo, the one that was decided by Chief Justice, Chief Justice Bersamin. So, last question. Now, you want to join the Supreme Court, Justice Soromon? Yes, what yes. Best, best qualifications do you think will qualify you to become a member of the Supreme Court? Well, Your best qualifications? My industry. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm very passionate in my work, my industry, Your Honor. And, uh, um, I, I have uh, I have uh, I believe that uh, it could be more of uh, a dedication and hard work to being a member of the Supreme Court. So those are the traits that I can also qualify. I have I'm very compassionate or passionate with my work. I also I also have dedication and hard work. You are. Thank you, Justice uh, Saruman. Good luck. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you, Chief Justice. That concludes the, the interview of Justice Edwin Solomon. Justice Solomon, good luck. Oh, thank you. Good luck, Justice. Thank you. The next uh, candidate for interview.
will be Court of Appeals Associate Justice Nina Antonio Valenzuela. The first to interview her will be the Honorable Justice Vicente Veloso III. Congressman Veloso. Hey, uh, thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Congressman. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, Justice Nina. Okay. okay uh, you used to be a, uh, an RTC judge. Yes, sir. Also an MTC, sir. MTC, then RTC. Okay. Uh, so you're very familiar with uh, the work in these first and second level courts. Yes, sir. Uh, tell me, as I asked uh, earlier by uh, the Chief Justice, what is your best uh, qualification for the Supreme Court? Be the best one, sir. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm a very independent person. Independent, uh, independence and integrity are my two best um, qualities, sir. Okay. Uh, to be uh, a justice of the Supreme Court, you yes. should uh, be competent. Also, sir. But you were asking the best. So. <laughs> That's why. Uh, uh, you believe that you are competent? Yes, sir. I uh, yes. Um, I have been in the judiciary for uh, 20, 20 years as a judge. Um, and uh, all from law school, I already started at the Supreme Court and then the Court of Appeals. So my entire career has been in the judiciary, Your Honor. So uh, you're familiar with CB, CIBI. You should be competent, endowed uh, with uh, independence, integrity, and probity. Uh, you believe that you have all those four things. Uh, uh, the uh, Chief Justice uh, earlier asked about uh, bail. Uh, is bail uh, a matter of right or a privilege? Um, it depends, sir, if, it, if the penalty imposable is uh, reclusion, perpetual life imprisonment or death, then um, bail is not a matter of right. It is discretionary on the part of the judge. Uh, discretionary in the sense that the judge uh, has to look at the uh, pieces of evidence presented before him. Yes, is that correct? Yes, that is correct, Your Honors. And the burden of proving uh, in the case of uh, crime punishable, for example, by reclusion, perpetual life imprisonment, the burden of proving uh, probable cause is on the part of whom? Uh, the prosecution, sir. Prosecution. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of uh, search warrant. Yes, sir. Search warrant. Uh, is uh, Rule 126, Section 4 of the Rules of Court on Search Warrant is an implementation of a constitutional provision? Yes, sir. Uh, what is the Constitution? There is a provision in the Constitution that require, that uh, authorizes only a judge to issue a search warrant um, and he should personally examine the witnesses and uh, should describe the place to be searched and the items to be seized. Take note that in Section 4, Rule 126, uh, the uh, probable cause in, search, in the matter of search warrant is specific offense oriented. Yes, sir. What is the meaning of that? Um, you have to specify uh, the act uh, complained of and also um, and the the complainant should uh, uh, identify in detail the act complained of, and if possible, the law that is uh, violated. And the and, um, the person, the complainant, should uh, take the witness stand as well as it was his witnesses also, so that the judge can personally examine all of them. Okay. Yeah. Uh... 
Article 3, which is the Bill of Rights, Section 2, uh, touches uh, the right of people to be secure in persons, houses, etc., meaning on matters that have to be searched. Okay. Uh, but they did not notice any uh, provision that it should be specific offense oriented. Can you say that Rule 126, Section 4, in limiting the search warrant to a specific offense contravenes the Constitution? No, Your Honor, sir, because the rules of court also um, should uh, acknowledge that uh, the citizens have the right to privacy as well and uh, uh, allowing uh, the implementation of search warrants would be also uh, going against the right of privacy. So there is a certain balance that has to be struck, sir. Yeah, but so um, against uh, there is no prohibition against a detailed one. In fact, it is um, supportive of the constitutional mandate. Uh, uh, no, the bill uh, a right of uh, every citizen to privacy, and that supports that matter, sir. Again, uh, the Bill of Rights section two says no search warrant or shall issue except upon probable cause mm -hmm. to determine personally by the judge, etc. But it does not say that it should be limited to a particular offense, specific offense. Whereas uh, Rule 126, Section 4 says the probable cause must be in connection with one specific offense to be determined personally by the judge. So that, um, that would uh, mean that the search warrant would be uh, more specific such that there can be no searches that uh, um, are that are not part of uh, an act, which it would be like a fishing expedition if the the violation is is not specified. So this particular provision of the rules of court, um, if taken together with the right to privacy, um, is not violative of the constitution. There's no problem. Uh, okay, uh, I'll go to my last question. Uh, when can you enforce a judgment? Hello? Yes, sir. When can you enforce a judgment? Um, well, first, it, the judgment has to be final and executory. Number two, um, And there's already a, a motion for its execution because ju um, judgments issued by uh, the, the courts uh, need to be executed. I'm, I'm talking about the trial court, sir. And so you have to fa have had a motion for execution and then uh, then the court will have to hear the motion and then yes, uh, issue the appropriate writ of execution, Your Honor, sir. So that's exactly my question. When can you file a motion to enforce a judgment? Oh, um, five years. Uh, well, under the rules, you have five years. Uh, you're familiar with uh, the procedure in uh, first level and even uh, Court of Appeals, uh, even as far as the court. Uh, uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, now yes, yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, uh, upon finality of a judgment under Section 2, Rule 36, it behooves uh, the, the clerk of court to uh, uh, put on record the finality of that judgment. What do you call that uh, book? Entry of judgment, sir. Book of entry, sir. Okay, so you have to enter or the book of entry of judgment, the finality of, uh, of uh, the judgment. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, so it's an injunction against the clerk of court. Injunction? It is It is a mandate against the... Uh, Ministerial, the, yes, Your uh, Honor, sir. Uh, yeah, it, it's a mandate to the uh, clerk of court. It is not even a mandate to the uh, court because uh, the court uh, has only to file his judgment with the clerk of court 
and uh, the clerk of court will have to determine if it's final before he enters uh, uh, that judgment in the book of entries. Yes, Your Honor. Can uh, a judge de deny a motion for uh, issuance of a writ of execution uh, because uh, there is no uh, entry of judgment yet? Uh, no, Your Honor, an entry of judgment is not a requisite uh, in order that uh, a judgment which has become final and executory uh, may be a, may be uh, effected, Your Honor. Oh, uh, I got you right. Uh, the number an entry, of... An entry of judgment is not a requisite final motion for the issuance of a writ of execution. Can you please repeat the question? It's choppy, sir. Uh, uh, a prevailing party, okay, an RTC judge in particular denied a motion to a rate of execution mm -hmm. because it was filed beyond five years from the finality of the decision. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes. Agree with that. Yes, sir. Hmm? Yes, sir. If, if it is filed beyond the five-year period uh, after uh, the, the judgment has become final and executor executory, yes, um, the, count, the, the period starts to run from then. Uh, but from uh, but uh, there is Section 6, Rule 39, which says... Uh, it, this is already an injunction against the party, the prevailing party. You have to file the motion for the issuance of a written institution within five years from date and date of judgment. Which means uh, you cannot compel the court to issue a written institution unless there has been an entry of judgment and that the same has been entered in the book of entries. Uh, starting from the, in fact, the five-year period starts from the date of entry. The entry. So that's a distinction between an injunction against the clerk of court versus an injunction against the prevailing party. Mm -hmm. In Section 2, Rule 36, it is the clerk of court that is mandated to enter the book of entries of uh, judgment, the finality of uh, the judgment. And uh, in Section 6 of 39, the, it is the prevailing party that is mandated to move for the execution of a final judgment within five years from date of entry. So these are two different things. One is Section 2 of 36, the other is Section 6 of 39. Uh, in fact, uh, that is one case now that has, uh, that has caused... Uh, a problem to uh, an RTC judge because just uh, what you said, the uh, motion for execution should have been filed within five years from the finality and the prevailing party has nothing to do with it because it is the clerk of court that has to enter on record uh, the, uh, the finality, the book of entries, the finality of that judgment, especially uh, if at that time the the case was uh, went as far as the Supreme Court. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, Your Honours, uh, that would be all uh, with me. Uh, and uh, good luck to you, Justice Nina. Thank you, Your Honour. Thank you, Justice Veloso. The next to interview the candidate will be the Honourable Justice Noel Jimenez Tiham. Justice Tiham, sir. Thank you, Attorney Arachenta. Good afternoon, Justice Dina. Good afternoon, Your Honor. You still look fresh. You're not, you don't look wilted. <laughs> How long have you been waiting since uh, this morning? I woke up at 6, Your Honor. At 6 o'clock. Okay. Yeah. Are you a religious person, Justice Dina? Uh, I was very spiritual from the beginning, but 
I only became religious after my son was in an accident. Uh, there's a question from a religious, from a priest friend of mine who wanted to ask you this question. Would the Holy See, the Vatican, have legal personality to enter into a treaty with the Republic of the Philippines to the effect that all judgments with respect to marriages declared void by church tribunals in the Philippines be given full faith and credit by the Republic. Is that possible? Um, it is the Holy See that will the Vatican. The, the, the Vatican, it is a, considered a state. Um, the Holy See is a state and it will file the action in the Philippines, Your Honor. To enter into a treaty, uh, a treaty. with the Republic of the Philippines. Uh, and the treaty uh, is to the effect that all judgments of religious tribunals in the Philippines declaring certain marriages to be void will be given full faith and credit by the Republic of the Philippines. Is that possible? Um, well, the, the Holy, the Vatican has a personal has personality to file that um, to enter into the agreement, and so does the Philippine government. So, if if that treaty is concluded between the Philippine government and the Vatican State to the effect that marriages declared by judgment by religious tribunals, because there are matrimonial religious tribunals in the country that, uh, that have jurisdiction to uh, declare certain marriages void, and that the treaty proposes that <clears throat> these judgments be given full faith and credit by the government. If that treaty is concluded, would that be constitutional or can it be declared struck down by the court as unconstitutional? Can it be struck down by... Well, um, the constitution uh, makes uh, marriage invi an inviolable social institution. So um, maybe somebody... But... Some but uh, Church, the church, through their uh, matrimonial tribunals, you, you have heard about it, that they have declared in certain cases void, marriages as void, but they want this to be given full faith and credit by the Philippine government. Is that a, is that a valid provision in a treaty? Um, to, just, just your opinion. I don't, because I, um, there is such a thing as a separation of powers. And so the, the church, um, impose, but the church imposing its um, rulings um, by, via the canonical, um, canonical courts, imposing them on, um, for Filipino citizens um, would not have a civil effect, civil law effect. Maybe church, maybe uh, canonical as well. But as far as severing the ties um, uh, under the family code, I don't think that would be effectual. Sir. But if it is a treaty concluded by the Republic, presumably it is with the consent of the executive as well as the legislative, but not by the judiciary. Do you think the judiciary will feel offended by the treaty and um, uh, will consider it as a usurpation of judicial power on the declaration of certain marriages as well? Um, the, the, the doctrine of separation of powers could be invoked as well also as um, the constitutional provision that marriage is an inviolable social institution. So exactly up to now, we do not have a divorce, um, a divorce law. All right. What is your understanding, Justice Nina, of the doctrine of parents patria? You, you recall that? Parents patria is um, when uh, it's uh, 
the exercise of an institution of uh, certain responsibilities, acting like a parent. For example, schools are have the have the um, are also parents patriae. The concept of parents patriae can be applied to schools. Can it apply to the state itself? Also, to take, yes. to take care of the welfare of its citizens. Yes, Your Honor. Can parents go to court and legally sue their disobedient children under the doctrine of parents patria? It depends. They can go, go to court to sue their children, but there has to be a specific act that is violative of a specific law and not just the general doctrine, Your Honor. If it's there's, an, there's a provision of the Family Code, Article 223, which says that the parents are in their absence or incapacity, the individual entity or institution exercising parental authority may petition the proper court of the place where the child resides for an order providing for disciplinary measures over the child. Is this an example of an exercise of parents' patria, you think? Yes, yes, Your Honor. Now, with respect to the ABS-CBN petition, Congressman Pichai opined that ABS-CBN does not need a legislative franchise to operate because the requirement under the law applies only to public broadcasting companies and not to private broadcasting companies. According to the Congressman, under Republic Act 7925, the Public Telecommunications Pub Policy Act of 1995, the terms telecommunication, broadcasting, public telecommunication entity and franchise were clearly defined. And the definition of a public telecommunications entity does not include broadcasting, which is a separate and distinct activity. Uh, I do not know if you have read the law, but uh, do you share that sentiment by Congressman Pichai? Um, uh, Your Honor, uh, the Constitution says that uh, a franchise is only um, is a privilege and not a right, and only uh, Congress can. Um, uh, grant uh, the privilege and so if that law gives the defines uh, um, only gives uh, only includes uh, public uh, corporations um, in the definition then I think that would not uh, that would be unconstitutional the Supreme Court, through the initiative of the Chief Justice, issued certain guidelines for the decongestion of the jail, especially during this time of pandemic, uh, with respect to the possibility of granting bail to low-risk prisoners, nonviolent detainees, and even persons charged with capital offenses. But unfortunately, the Constitution and the rules of court require that with respect to persons charged with capital offenses, they may post bail only if the evidence of guilt is not strong. And the requirement in practice, actually, and this is being done by judges, is to conduct a full-blown trial and requiring the presentation of evidence to ascertain whether the evidence of guilt is not strong. Concerning, considering the urgency of the matter, because there is a pandemic, and some prisoners accused of, of crimes and who are presently detained have been afflicted by the COVID-19, what do you think, what, what are the things a judge should take into account in expediting a summary in expediting the hearing on the grant of bail 
and make it summary. What are the things the judge should consider so that he can immediately make a decision whether to grant bail or not? Um, because of the abnormalcy of the circumstances we face, um, perhaps we could um, um, consider uh, the filing of affidavits, judicial affidavits. In the, Is uh, public safety by itself an important consideration? Um, Let's um, say in that particular jail, almost 25% of the detainees are afflicted. Is that by itself an important consideration? It would, it would justify the necessity to speed up the grant of bail. Um, public, um, public health, public welfare, public safety. So perhaps um, in lieu of uh, direct testimonies, um, judicial affidavits, and considering that um, the evidence um, received during the hearing, the bail hearing would also form part of uh, the, the tr trial in chief, then maybe at the trial, um, they could, uh, the defense could cross-examine uh, the prosecution witnesses. But in yeah. the meantime, we will just allow the judicial affidavits in lieu of the direct testimonies, Your Honor. You're familiar with the civil code. Uh, is it the duty of a married woman to use the surname of her husband? Under under the civil code, um, a married woman has three uh, options. Uh, number one, to use her maiden name. So I would be Nina Antonio. Um, and then the second one would be to use hi your um, her um, her maiden name and with a hyphenated uh, a, a appended appending the surname of her husband. So I will be Nina Antonio Valenzuela. Or the third option would be um, I will be um, I will just use the name of my husband and affix uh, the suffix. Uh, the prefix Mrs. So I'd be Mrs. Alberto Valenzuela. Article 370 of the Civil Code says a married woman may use her maiden first name and surname and add her husband's surname. So Nina Antonio Valenzuela, which you're using, right? Or he may use her maiden first name and her husband's surname, Nina Valenzuela. That's the second situation. And the third situation, or he can use her husband's full name and by prefixing Mrs. So Mrs., the name of your husband and your uh, married name. All right. But can a married woman use, in your case, just use Nina Antonia, period? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That is in but the three code. But Article 370 does not speak of that. Family code, sir. Family code, yes, or is it by virtue of that decision? There's a family code provision, I believe. Justice Carpet, and you can use. The next paragraph would be. Uh, can if, you can you revert if, back even and? If you're can, if, even can if you're once, once you have chosen, once you have chosen, a the mode of uh, affixing your surname. Can you change your mind and go back to... Yeah, there is no prohibition, sir. All right. Although, uh, if, if you are annulled and you are the guilty party, you have to drop your husband's surname. All right. I, I'll, I will give you a giveaway question. All right. Are you familiar? What do you understand by a sunset provision? Or a sunset law. Sunset in the twilight years. Did you say sunset provision? The opposite of that is a sunrise provision in a contract. A contract clause. A sunset provision in a contract or a sunset law. The opposite being a sunrise. Can you make um, a guess? Maybe um, winding up, Your Honor. Winding up. Um, 
provisions for uh, ending the contract. The Bayanihan Heal in One Act yes. provides that after a period of three months, it will expire because it is a grant of sort of emergency power to the president for the period mm -hmm. of pandemic. Is that a sunset? Similar to a sunset law or a sunrise law? Maybe sunset because it tackles endings. So it will automatically expire upon a specific date reach, correct? Unless it is extended or renewed by Congress. Now what about a sunrise provision? Can you make a guess what the sunrise provision is? Mm. Maybe um, the contract will arise, and that will be a conditional contract. The, the contract will have a, um, arise after the happening of certain events, and there will be a particular provision in the contract. In a reinsurance contract, let's say covering goods, for example, so it's a renewable every year, so covered for 2019, and then renewed for 2020. If an event took place in 2019 and losses were discovered in 2020, uh, under the concept of a sunrise provision, what would be, can you visualize or guess what would be the effect of that? Then the, 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 the loss uh, would be covered will be covered Queen. if it is so provided that in yeah. the renewal contract that it will cover losses even if the events that came, that caused the loss took place previous to that so that is the sunrise provision is it lawful for doctors to euthanize patients with severe dementia or persons with unbearable suffering. <clears throat> there was a <clears throat> an actual case, excuse me, decided by the Supreme Court of the Netherlands last April that it is lawful for doctors to euthanize patients with severe dementia, provided that the patient had expressed a desire, either written or discussed in advance directly with their doctor to be euthanized while still legally capable of doing so. If Congress passes a law similar to that, would that be constitutional? I think so, sir. If there is a law, there are those details that um, there was a signed uh, contract by the patient and because the, the Constitution also uh, um, um, guarantees uh, happiness, a happy, healthy life. So, so I it, guess it, that it, would it, be it would be constitutional. <clears throat> now, what about a woman who suffers from a medical condition? Mm -hmm. And the doctors suggest or uh, are of the belief that future pregnancies can put her health at risk and can even cause her death. So they suggested that she be fitted with a contraceptive device against her will. Against her will. Yes, because uh, that's the only way to save her, to prevent her from dying. <coughs> that's a case decided in the United Kingdom. If, if a law is passed in the country allowing that kind of practice will that be constitution if it is with um well the 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 constitution grants uh the right to privacy and uh so to ha to have a device um implanted in one's body is an affront to privacy so that if uh if the law mandates even without the consent of the woman that all persons um, who have who have medical conditions should be implanted 
then that would be unconstitutional. But if okay. she uh, issues a waiver, then that is perfectly all right because uh, that's her body and she has the right to uh, determine what is uh, implanted. And my last question, uh, Justice Nina, is if a person is discharged from the armed forces or any military service on the basis of the sexual orientation or homosexuality, do you think there's a violation of human rights and other fundamental freedom? If there is, um, I would, um, if there is a law that specifically prohibits uh, the, uh, uh, specifically defines the uh, particular gender and prohibits uh, let's say homosexuality, then that is violative of the constitution, then um, it would be unconstitutional. To is that not, is there a, under existing laws, is there basis for considering it as sexual discrimination? Under the, because there is no law now that allows, uh, or this allows, um, uh, homosexuality in the AFP, so uh, there is no sexual discrimination, no violation of sexual discrimination. All right, thank you. That will be all. Uh, good luck, Justice Nina. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Justice Tiham. The next to interview Justice Valenzuela will be the Honorable Judge Toribio Ilao, Jr. Judge Ilo, sir. Excuse me. Judge Ilo. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Having trouble. Excuse me. Can I? No sound. Not moving. Judge Ilo, can you hear us all? We'll ask you to unmute your audio call, Judge. We'll send a request. Thank you. No sound. Judge Ilo's uh, internet signal is low, so we we'll just ask him to unmute his audio. Your honors, please stand by. Uh, there's really no sound. Okay. Yes, Justice. Uh, his internet signal is low, so we already asked him to turn on his audio. Rajilo, can you hear us? Attorney Arichetta, I think uh, we're yes. having technical yeah. problems as of the moment because the internet signal of Judge Hilo is uh, low. Shall we go we to Ms. Mendoza? With the permission of uh, Chief Justice Paul. Uh oh, current fluctuated. I'm a brown out. Will I run the chief? I am. They will ask chief. Chief Justice. Chief. We chief. are addressing the technical glitch now, but. Uh, is coming from uh, Judge Ilao's uh, internet signal. So uh, with the permission of uh, the Honorable Chief Justice uh, Peralta. Chief Justice, Mr. Chief Justice, sir, are you online? Hello, sir. Mm. 
Yes, Mr. Chief Justice. We are now experiencing uh, some technical difficulty on the part of Judge Ilao because his internet signal is low, but we're trying to address the technical glitch as of the moment. With your permission, uh, Chief Justice, uh, Attorney Aricheta, the next yes. interviewer is... Uh, yes. Sir, Attorney Ralph, may kausap lang daw si Chief. Uh, Chief Justice is here already. Okay. I'm here. So who will hold the next? Justice Bambil? Supposed to be Judge Ilaw, sir. But uh, okay. make a technical glitch, so can we go to Justice Mendoza? Yeah, we can move to him. Yeah. Thank you, Chief. Yes. yes. Uh, uh, like uh, Justice uh, Sorongon, I have extensively interviewed uh, Justice Valenzuela, so I will no longer ask questions to have a break the proceedings. The Chief Justice can ask, ask questions now. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, just, just, uh, just, uh, just a few questions. Now, what will happen after me? What about just, what about Judge uh, Judge Ilao? When will he be? He will already be waiving his interview. All uh, right, and uh, now, uh, Mr. Chief Justice, sir, we are trying to ad address the technical glitch. We will uh, call him through uh, the his mobile phone, po, and then we'll we will get back to you, po. I will uh, message Attorney Aricheta if he's already online, Chief Justice. Thank you. Okay, okay. So I will be the one to ask the questions now. Now you are now a chairperson, just Justice Nina. Senior, sir. Senior member. Hey, now. Senior, sir. Senior, senior. Senior member, uh, my chair is Justice Leo Gogo, sir. Okay, so you are now number 20. 20, 20, 20 Your Honor. 24. Yeah, yes, Your Honor. Now, uh, what do you, you decide to apply for the position of uh, justice when your rank is uh, still on the, tw still on the uh, 24th? And uh, we have provided in our rules that we might, we might uh, give preference uh, to the senior one. So may I know what you are, best, your qualifications, or your best qualifications to qualify you as a member of the as member of the, uh, the, the Supreme Court, considering that your rank is uh, 24? My, my best qualification, even if I am young, but I, I have uh, been in the judiciary since after law school, so. I've never been any, I've never done any kind of work other than this. Indeed. So I guess ah, I, well, right after graduation from school, you joined the Court of Appeals? Or is it no, the Court of Appeals? Supreme Court, sir. Supreme Court, Your Honor. Ah, Supreme Court. How long did you stay in the Supreme Court? Uh, uh, like less than a year because they were all retiring. <laughs> Uh, okay. uh, so first Supreme Justice uh, Morfina, then Justice Bidin. No, but Justice Bidin, I moved um, to the Court of Appeals. And you were you you were under Justice Belventura Guerrero, I think. Uh, that for almost eight years, Your Honor. And then you were appointed RTC judge. Manila. MTC, Your Honor. MTC oh, Manila, Your Honor. So you started from the ranks, starting as a court attorney in the Supreme Court until you reach your present position. Yes, Your Honor. Your best qualification, therefore, is that probably among all the applicants, you have served uh, the most number of years in the judiciary. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. okay. Now, I asked this question to uh, Justice Rongon about our problem on hierarchy of courts. Yes, that, Your Honor. Uh, the, what one, 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 the petitions that they filed here before the Supreme Court, Rule 65, uh, where the respondent, uh, respondents are usually quasi-judicial quasi bodies. No? And under the rule, if, it, if what is questioned is a uh, rulemaking act or quasi-legislative act, then it cannot be the subject matter of Rule 65. Mm -hmm. Am I correct? Yes, Your Honor. So, if that is, if, uh, if those are, should not be, uh, those cases should not be filed in the first place before the Supreme Court because, as I said, they refer to rulemaking act or quasi legislative. Uh, or quasi mm -hmm. act. Now, if you now in the Supreme Court, how will you get rid of all these petitions, Rule 65, questioning the constitutionality 
of a legislative quasi legislative act or rule making act perhaps there should be a first screening first screening like um so you can weed out the 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 cases that that are purely constitutional um pure um novel issues uh, with novel issues uh, with matters uh, of transcendental importance and um, all the rest perhaps you can just um, uh, throw to the court of appeals I, uh, can, can, because can you have a, the supreme court has a rule making power so it could be uh, tweaked in such a way that there is a delineation like in America, very few cases are allowed because they have. Uh, um, can the can the court can the court uh, instead dismiss the case and then require the petitioners? Can the court can the court issue an order uh, requiring the petitions to be filed before the regular trial court? Can we, can we do that or can we just dismiss it on the ground that uh, it is a violation of the hierarchy of courts? If, if there is, a, if they are exclusive and original, because the law, the law uh, identifies jurisdictions. If there, there are, um, uh, there are courts with co-equal jurisdictions, with the same jurisdictions, then there needs to be, um, amendment to the law that will allow the Supreme Court to, no, not the Supreme Court, uh, that will allow uh, certain cases to uh, to be given to uh, the jurisdiction of the lower courts. Should be specific law, sir, cannot be uh, uh, rulemaking only because it's jurisdictional. Do you think that it would be better to file declaratory relief? Do you think that it would be better to file a declara declaratory relief before the RTC? To determine what, sir? Well, the same, the same question. There are, uh, there are cases that are filed before the RTC on declaratory relief, questioning the uh, questioning the constitutionality of uh, some laws or of, uh, some provisions of law. There are. Uh, if I think it's possible because declaratory relief would be uh, one remedy to determine uh, which court right. uh, there is an obligation to the parties precisely you're asking for the declaration of a, the constitutionality of provision of the law because it, in, it involved the rights and obligations of parties so that would be the proper remedy is it not? Do you think that would be yes, better? That would be better instead of filing a petition for certiorari before the court, because the Supreme Court has no jurisdiction on the declaratory relief. What okay. jurisdiction of Supreme declaratory okay. relief? Eh? So can we just declare because this is a case of declaratory relief. This case should be filed before the proper court. Can, can the court can, can the court do that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, let's go to another another another. Uh, how long have you been an RTC judge, uh, justice in uh, Manila? I think in Manila. Five years, Your Honor. Four years five in years. four years in the MTC. Five years in the RTC. Ten so years in the C. So you are familiar with the rules that govern uh, uh, the first level courts and also the second level courts. Yes, sir. But yeah. there are many new one, new rules now. Mediation was not yet. Uh, uh, we were pilot. We were pilot. In fact, our branch got the award for the most. Yes, we got an award for that. It was already mediation when you were in the RTC. It was pilot. Oh. Pilot testing, sir. Pilot testing. So, pa pa uh, mediation during your time probably was. Uh, I think at that time, or until now, until now, mediation takes place. Before pre trial, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Remember that? Do you yes. think that do you think that pre trial should take should first take place before any mediation? Frankly, at the time, sir, it 
um, it was not effective. Perhaps the mid the the system was not yet uh, needed more tweaking because it only lengthened the trial. It lengthened the process. Um, people were not um, um, amenable to mediating at that time, but. We got the highest number of mediations, but still, it took a long time. So, so in other words, if there is a mediation, it, uh, it, it, it makes uh, longer uh, the termination of civil cases. Is but I don't said? know now, Your Honor, maybe they, they have streamlined the process because we were pilot and, and okay. it was not you, very effective. Oh, in your mind, it should be better to proceed first with pre-trial before mediation. Are we not giving a because chance to the first? You have to give first the just the chance to settle the parties' differences in a pre-trial before going to mediation. I think um, better than rather than mediation before pre-trial. You were choppy. Yeah, my 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 question is this, no? If your observation before is that mediation prolongs the termination of a civil case, because at that time, mediation takes place before pre-trial. Yes. Now, do you think that it would be better if you proceed first to pre-trial so that the judge may be given the chance to settle the parties before they go to mediation? If they be, Perhaps. To go to med do you think that would be better? Yes, and also if pre-trial is already finished, um, all the admissions of facts will be there already. So the parties would be aware already of their chances. So that could be also a bargaining point. So have you, have you read the new rules on civil procedure? Have you read the rules on the new uh, new, rule, new rules on the civil procedure? Some of some of it not completely, Your Honor. Uh, did, did you read the portion uh, pre-trial? Will take place before mediation. Uh, no, I only read the summons that the party can serve the summons. Uh, yeah, the Not party now can serve the summons. Yeah. Yes. Of course, uh, through a motion. Yeah. Yes, yes. But, uh, but yeah, you were just uh, before. Pre trial is the best uh, tool in order to terminate you know, the case because you can go to a summary judgment or judgment of the pleading after you have determined. The issue now under the new rule, it should not be the judge. The judge cannot declare the case of impact. Not in the court of appeals. Can you mention impact one? On what, sir? <laughs> well, on the people, on the public impact. In other words, it affects it affects it affects everybody. Mm, okay. mm. There was one case that was decided by Justice Lantion. A Republic versus Manalo, that is an impact on marriages or on have, the I divorce. Have, uh, I have uh, nothing where I was ponente, but I was member of the division that did the BT Talong, the, the BT what? Talong, Talong eggplant, sir. Uh, um, long, uh, it uh, was by Justice Di Maampao, but uh, I was, I sat in the, I was the junior GMO. member. Yes, the GMO, very, very interesting, and it impacted uh, the whole, the whole country and even Southeast Asia. Yeah. But it about uh, whether or not the rate of Kalikasan is proper. Yes, that was a very interesting hearing. But by the decision, however, on a motion for reconsideration, declared that the issues are already moot. Mm -hmm. Am I correct? Yeah, yes. Very, um, an expanded decision and the uh, motion for reconsideration, the yes. Supreme Court believed yes. believe then, believe then that if the issues have become moot and are they that, that case by the Supreme, the CA and the Supreme Court impacted the whole world. It was the first I heard in the entire world. Yeah, yeah. Regarding uh, him. Genetically modified organism. I think that's the yes. one. Yes. So under that one, you cannot recall of any case. You have been how many years in the in the court of appeals? Nothing that in, 
where I was ponented that in that had any impact on what, 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 what subjects do you what subjects do you teach justice not now because uh, I am on leave but uh, I used to teach uh, I used to teach legal writing mm-hmm. and um, legal research and trial trial techniques so will, uh, will that help you in your being considered as a member of the Supreme Court? Your uh, your experience as a professor of law, as a professor of law, will that help you? Um, be being considered? a member of yes, Your Honor, being a member of the academy should have. Uh, I'm sorry, okay. Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justice. I have no more questions to ask. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Chief Justice. The next to interview the candidate is the Honorable Judge Toribio Ilao Jr. Judge Ilao, sir. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Judge Ilao. Yes, good afternoon. Sorry. Sorry for the delay. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, convenience. I'm sorry because uh, you know I'm living in a depressed area here in Manila. The signal is not clear. Also, like, uh, sir, there is lightning, and the light is. Uh, I see. There is lightning and thunder here. Unlike the present African who's living in, you're living in the Ayala Alabang. Yes, Your Honor. <laughs> All right. But there's thunder and lightning, just the same. <laughs> I thought the, I I thought there was light. All right. Good afternoon. How are you today, Justice Nina? I know you already tired as well as members of the JVC. So, all, so are all of you, Your Honors. I'm sorry to keep you. Anyway, uh, the records of the JVC show. A judicial audit conducted in the Regional Trial Court, Branch 28, Manila. That's when uh, you were still then the presiding judge, according to the OCA clearance, granting your good self an extension of six months from March 20, it was still 2005, within which for you to decide the 24 criminal cases, 18 civil cases and 12 cases. And uh, to require you to furnish the court copies of the decisions in the affirmation cases within 10 days from condition thereof. There is no proof of compliance with respect to your EDS still pending. Had you complied with this uh, Yes. Requirement of the <clears throat> Office of the Court Administrator. May I be allowed, Your Honor, to explain the circumstances. When I was appointed from the MTC Manila to the RTC Manila, um, the court was in shambles. They had no uh, logbook of any sort, nothing. Everything, even the uh, registry receipts, were thrown in a basket, not attached to the court records, etc. So everything was in shambles. So I deemed it proper upon the advice of certain justices at the Supreme Court to uh, um, request for a judicial audit before I touched anything, before I started um, my judicial functions, because I was newly um, appointed. At that time, um, so they they brought... um, they even brought a uh, dog sniffing para ordinance because the 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 safe was not open. They did not want to open it for me, and so the Supreme Court even sent a uh, sack and dogs. And so then the audit came, audit team came and they discovered that so many cases had been uh, undecided um, beyond the periods, and so. The court, the Supreme Court, um, required me, directed me, ordered me to uh, decide everything. And so, seeing that I was, I would not, because aside from that, 
I they all the Supreme Court all the office the office of the court administrator also required <coughs> to do an evidence audit because the evidence had no labels. Um, so I did an evidence audit. So I um, I could not uh, write the decisions, decide the decisions on time in, during the time given to me because I was doing the other audit, the, even the the um, appliance, the the all the office uh, office um, machines had to be audited as well by me and the staff. So I deemed it appropriate to write a motion for extension. And I did uh, write a motion for extension and the court granted me a uh, motion uh, until September, until March, until March, Your Honor. And so I decided, uh, but then I discovered during, uh, before, even before I started the hearing, so I decided those that could be decided. The others, before I started to conduct the hearing, I wrote letters to all to all the cases that were included in the OCADS um, in the OCADS list of cases that were supposedly in the docket, each case I wrote and required the counsel and the parties to come to the court to compare their records with the records of the court, so that I could be sure of the integrity of the records because I was not sure, and so. After they complied, all the parties complied, it was then that I discovered that mo many of the cases indicated in the court administrator's report in the, and in the audit report were not really submitted for a decision. They were still um, doing trial. And then there were other cases that um, where the TSNs were missing. So we had to do a retake. And so... That's why I had to ask for a motion for extension. And then after I decided the cases, I would um, uh, submit to the court administrator the copy of my decisions. I, have, I decided all of them. In fact, when I applied for the CA, I got a clearance. The problem now is I have no proof anymore because there had been three Supreme Court resolutions for destruction of the records. I, <laughs> so I cannot prove. But if I was thinking, if I did not decide, then the parties would complain. There is no complainant. And in fact, I, I, wasn't, I did not know that I had an administrative case until I applied uh, in January last year the judicial audit was conducted sometime in 2005 yes your honor i was newly appointed your honor but uh, through the initiative of the jvc we have here oka certificate dated february 3 2020 with sealed envelope Submitted to third division on November 22, 2019, indicating that uh, Justice Valenzuela submitted her compliance only on January 22, 2019, as per OCA report dated March 12, 2020. Compliance to what, Your Honor? Uh, maybe do you are re required to. After I, it? after I applied, and the uh, attorney Kayosa informed me that I had allegedly a case, and she gave me the paper, and they required me to give a list, and that's when that's the only time I complied. January twenty nineteen, I think. And I, I even went to the court, to the RTC. The problem, Your Honor, is um, there have been three clerks of court, and they're all gone. The, the other <laughs> one's dead. So how can I prove it? And then the, ju the judges, they retired, and then the other one now is Court of Tax Appeals Justice. And there have yes. been... 
destructions of records. Anyway, anyway just uh, for the record. At any rate, uh, Justice, uh, you were not able to make it in your first attempt at the bar examinations. Yes, Your Honor. What did that experience teach you? There, um, it taught me that I was not smart enough, that I needed to work very hard. And yes, so, um, because if <laughs> I, uh, my student life, every time I teach, I say to them, this is what you shouldn't be. I was not a very good student. <laughs> I, uh, I was going to parties. I was having, I was having love life, going on dates, etc. Um, and then, ah, uh, yes. But I, I was, I would pass. <laughs> so I thought, oh, okay, you can wing this, but you, um, but some things you cannot wing all the time. And so when I plumped the bar, I said, okay, <laughs> I was jolted. And so, and also, honestly, I did not, because I took the bar twice, I did not think I would end up here. <laughs> but yeah, I'm here. Oh, yeah, so yes. there are second chances. If you work so, hard, I work very hard. Uh, if you were a member of the JPC, would you nominate to the highest court an applicant who took the bar more than once when there are many applicants who hurdled the bar in just one take? I would on your bar. I would, because the bar is not the only measure of competence, Your Honor. There are other things like credit. Uh, um, scholastic records and then um, further studies and then um, the actual performance, uh, my performance. Um, ever since I became a member of the judiciary, um, my output was almost a perfect one. So um, I was told that um, I had to pace myself. Um, number of cases in should equal number of cases out. That's my target since the beginning. So um, up to now, I'm 98.9%. So I think I'm doing pretty well. I may be, uh, I, I may get a low score on the my take too, but all the rest, I think I get good scores because I compensate. I try to compensate. All right, uh, one hand is uh, your cell end. Yes, Your Honor. Which we receive a copy thereof, March 15, 2019. Oh, yes. That's the latest, Your Honor. All right. The real properties indicated that you own lot with improvements residential at uh, 385 Batanga South Street, Ayala, Alabang, Montinlupa. Yes, Your Honor. In another, in another residential unit, my residential lot <clears throat> located at Mabini Street, Ayala, South Vale, Village, Bacoor, Cavite. Yes, Your Honor. And another one with a lot with improvement, residential, located at this address, 110 Apitong Street, Ayala, Alabang, Muntinlupa. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, you're awfully rich, Justice. Is this Ayala Alabang village? Rich or is relative, Your Honor. There are many, many richer people. <laughs> I am not rich. So which among your properties here in your south end are you renting out? Um... But it's vacant now, no renters now, because I am afraid of Pogo. <laughs> I have to be honest. <laughs> I know. I, they're, You're they're presently vacant. 
Because all Pogo which, uh, which are property is vacant? 110. Two years already, Your Honor. I'm afraid of them. All right. Uh, could you explain to us your financial position in 2016? Not much increase in network. Not? Much in network. There was an increase, 2016. Not much increase in network. Because my kid went to America. <laughs> Magastos po siya. Although he's in a, on a scholarship, but the other things, the food and the transportation. <laughs> he went to school. Yes. And he got a, into an accident also. In 20, yes, he, tragic accident. Near tragic. So... And we had to spend um, in America. He got into the accident in America. Almost lost him, yes. Your husband is also a lawyer, uh, Justice? Yes, Your Honor. A private practitioner. No? Yes, Your Honor. Solo practitioner or with associates? Solo, Your Honor. He works from home. This is his office. <laughs> and nice place. <laughs> All right. What is the role of the judiciary and magistrates during a state of public health emergency such as the coronavirus disease? Um, the role of the judiciary and the magistrates which is... Affected, which affected the hundreds of thousands globally and clean the lives of thousands. Um, is to implement the laws that protect uh, and uh, protect public health and safety. And uh, so, yes, so we have to um, ensure public health and public safety uh, for the citizens because that is enshrined in the constitution. And what have you been doing during the pandemic? Just this, just still stay at home. Oh, there's so much work. Um, my lawyers and I are continuously working. Um, I have learned to be the abyss techie. So uh, they continue sending me drafts and I continue checking and returning it to them all but electronically. So that, yes, and also my son arrived, and so I'm taking care of him. He's doing quarantine, taking care of my mother. I've been gardening and cooking, and tomorrow I will cut everybody's hair. <laughs> so I'm domesticated, but also doing my work as a justice. All right, uh you stated in your application letter that you are intelligent. <laughs> yes, Your Honor, but I think I'm an underachiever because why? It's very embarrassing, but when you take exams in the UP, they give you a, um, this, uh, a grade point average, um, a predicted grade point average. And all my averages uh, when I graduate are way, way far away from the predicted grade point average. So maybe I'm not too dull. Maybe I'm very lazy. I don't know. Because it's what far, is far away. What is your measure of intelligence, Justice? Intelligence? This is on record. Uh, total, total. It cannot be just in school uh, with all the medals and the awards. Intelligence should include emotional um, grit, resilience, that would be part of intelligence. Um, empathy, high empathy to people, that would be very important and should be part of intelligence. There. 
Director, what is your concept of judicial efficiency? This is a giveaway question. And uh, how would you attain this if appointed? I guess in, in numerically, you are judicially efficient if you have a one-to-one -one ratio, if you can keep a 100% one-to-one ratio input and output. And then also you um, judicial efficiency would uh, be um, also measured by your reversals, if, um, the, the percentage of your reversals. If you have a low, if you have a low percentage, the lower percentage of reversals, the more uh, efficient you are as a judge. Is it not uh, judicial efficiency? the attainment of resolving the most number of cases in the least amount of time using the least amount of resources. That's exactly the meaning of the numbers, Your Honor, sir. All right. Uh, in a recent case, the court declared the non ordinance imposing speed limits unconstitutional. What are these prerequisites for an ordinance regulating land transportation and traffic rules to be valid and enforceable under Section 38 of Republic Act number 4136? Are you aware of this case? No, Your Honor. Sex. Case of municipality of Tupi versus Faustino. The issue was uh, what is what is a constitution if it is constitutional or not constitutional. The speed limits, Your Honor. Yes, because the court declared that the uh, speed limits unconstitutional. The question is, what are these prerequisites? For an ordinance regulating land transportation and traffic rules. To be constitutional? Yes, um, yes. It should be applicable to um, everybody in the same um, everybody in the same category um, and then uh, can't remember anymore. And uh, I can't remember. I'm sorry, Your Honor. What are your thoughts on the termination of the BFA by the President? The Visiting Forces Agreement, Your Honor. Yes, um, please. It is a personal prerogative to terminate it. And uh, but there's an issue if it is a treaty or an executive agreement. So, but I don't know if it was raised already. It, if it was raised, if it was questioned. Um, but he, the president could, with the with the concurrence of Congress. All right. My last question is this. If you had six months with no obligations and no financial constraints, what would you do during that time? No constraints. Mm. No obligations, no financial constraints. I'd read and sleep and read and sleep. That's all. And pray. <laughs> what will be your prayer? I, from I, no obligations and financial constraints. I just pray the rosary all the time. And it keeps me calm. Okay, thank you. That was my last and final question. Good luck again, the Justice. Thank you. And good day. Welcome. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Judge Ilo. That concludes the interview for Justice 
Valenzuela. Good luck also, Justice Valenzuela. Thank you, sir. Uh, your honors, there are no more matters to be taken up for today. Tony Leia.